This is episode 171 of the Beyond the Food Show. You're not going to want to miss this episode. I'm saying that right away at the beginning because this is going to become a core episode of our Going Beyond the Food Show. We're tackling the topic of the death of dieting and the rise of health at every size with a health at every size expert, Molly Barr. You're not going to want to miss this. This is a longer episode, but you have to listen to it. So stay tuned. My name is Stephanie Dodier, clinical nutritionist. I reversed my diagnosis of anxiety, depression, adrenal fatigue, and obesity by going beyond the food. I can tell you one thing, that willpower, discipline, and deprivation aren't the permanent solution to transforming your relationship to food. So how do you leave overeating, emotional eating, food craving, and binging behind you so you have the food freedom to achieve all of your goal and be happy now? As a top 25 alternative health podcast in the world, this is the Beyond the Food Show. This is a great moment. I wouldn't be any happier right now if I was skinnier, if my body looked different. It's truly been a beautiful process. This has been life-changing, and I am really grateful that I didn't wait another year. If you think that you're going to come into this and lose 20 pounds and eat perfectly for the rest of your life, then it's the wrong thing. But if you think you're going to come into this and have a life-changing experience, then it's worth every penny and more. The Going Beyond the Food Academy is the result of a lifelong journey in searching for my solution. All along, the solution was right there in front of me. And it's also right there for you, inside of you. You just want to eat normally, have a normal body, perhaps weigh less. You're looking for the solution to eat less, stop overeating, perhaps binging, maybe stop the endless desire to eat what is forbidden the sugar craving and you keep searching searching for the answer as to why your body doesn't want to collaborate with you and you've tried it all willpower discipline mental strength over exercising all the diet while shaming yourself and your body in hope that it would give you what you so desperately desire what I desired the most I thought was weight loss but really what I wanted was to fit in to be accepted, to be loved, to be happy unconditionally. What I didn't realize during the 25 years of dieting was that suffering was not necessary, that the answer was right there inside of me. But I refused to see it and accept it because it didn't fit with what I was told the solution was. The Going to Beyond the Food Academy is a 14-week journey towards creating and discovering your own solution. Think of it as the university-level course that will teach you what you need to know to finally get what you desire the most. The Going Beyond the Food Academy is a lifetime program that will show you what you need to heal why you eat because that's the real issue and we'll teach you a new way of engaging with food from a place of intuition resulting in a brand new way of how to eat the outcome of the going beyond the food academy is what you eat becomes normal easy and simple ditching dieting and becoming a normal eater So if you're ready to step into a new version of yourself, be empowered by me as your teacher in our amazing community to make the change you know you need to make. Head over to stephaniedodzie.com slash academy right now. So the academy has helped me figure out, like you said, feel it, don't fight it. Actually know that if I feel my feelings, I'm going to survive. It's going to be okay. I can sit with those and nothing bad is going to happen to me. Ladies, I'm back. You're back. And this is going to rock your world. I have talked about health at every size 
by bits and pieces here and here over the last 170 episodes, but I never made an entire episode about this. I had not yet found the right expert to come and talk to me about this, and I found her. Her name is Molly Barr, and Molly is going to rock your world. And I'm not like exaggerating. This is an interview that has the possibility of transforming how you engage with your weight, your body and your health. We've been talking about for the last, I don't know, six, seven episodes about hashtag on dieting 2019 and starting 2019 as the year of you. And I have been helping you move forward beyond dieting, but many people have the question, then what? If I'm not dieting, which I've been doing for 30, 20, 10 years, if I'm not doing that, what am I going to do? The truth is the act of dieting is the greater predictor of weight gain. And Molly will quote the CEO of Weight Watcher in the earlier part of the interview, and it's mind-blowing. Like, it is a known fact that diet doesn't work. Weight Watchers knows that. But their business is not built on the successful people. The business of Weight Watcher is built on the unsuccessful people who keep coming back. And that's the whole diet cycle. Furthermore, is the collateral effect of dieting. We'll lose weight temporarily and we'll gain more. That's a statistic. That's a fact. But beyond that, the food obsession, the mental chatter, the anxiety and the stress associating with constantly managing our weight and managing our food and exercise, it is affecting us. And as we get older, just like me, it's literally shutting down our nervous system. I mean, I ended up in hospital at 36 years old after 25 years of dieting. That is the collateral side effect of dieting that's affecting me, that's affecting a vast majority of you. Let's talk about mental health, the self-hatred that we grow to become who we are towards our body. And the further in we are in the diet cycle, the worse it gets. So beyond even gaining weight or losing weight, there is some serious collateral damage that health at every size with their different focus can help you. Now, health at every size is the cornerstone of the going to beyond the food method, along with something else called intuitive eating, which I'm going to do a separate episode on that. But what rocked my world when this book came in front of me at 39 years old, I mean, I had gone through an entire health science training, an entire nutrition training, and no one talked to me about health at every size or intuitive eating. I had to learn it through my own self-education and it literally threw me on the ground. It shook up everything that I knew. And that's how the going to be on the food method was born. So I want to share that with you. I want to get you to listen to this and then we'll have a discussion at the end of what we should do next. So let's go over to Molly. Molly Barr is a licensed mental health counselor. She has a private practice. She's currently in Haiti, so she's not taking clients, but she normally has a private practice focused on eating disorder, anxiety, depression, and trauma. And she practices under the health at every size lens and utilize CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, to help her patient, among other modalities. So Let's go over to Molly and talk about the death of dieting and the rise of health at every size. Welcome to the show, Molly. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to have Molly on the show. I met her on Instagram and here she is in my life right now on my podcast. I'm very excited to have her talk about health at every size and be our expert on that matter. But first, what is your journey into this world of not dieting and health at every size? How did that begin for you, Molly? So this all began 
because I've been dieting my whole life. Mm -hmm. And I have tried every diet known to person. And so my whole life, I thought I was just doing what was healthy. I was just trying to get into a normal BMI range and stay there and everything was going to be perfect, right? I was going to be healthy and live a long life. Or so I've been made to believe. I have been attracted to the therapy world since I was a teenager. So I always knew I wanted to be a therapist, which also meant I was really interested in working with eating disorders. So I got into the field. I still didn't know about haze or health at every size, I should say. I'll probably use the word haze moving forward. And I went to a seminar to learn more about eating disorders and I learned about health at every size. And so here I'd been in the field for quite a few years and I'd never heard of this and my world just came crashing down because I was embarrassed and I was angry and I was sad and I had so many emotions that came up when I learned about this. I felt like such a hypocrite. Here I've been dieting while working with clients and not realizing that it's really going against what I should have been you know, doing with my clients. It was very, very confusing, but here I am. And now I want to educate as many people as possible on health at every size and intuitive eating. So we can get back to ourselves and be able to live our lives without being obsessed with food in our bodies. It's crazy to think that in the world of therapy for eating disorder, the concept of health at every size is not there. And I was sharing with Molly earlier that in a holistic nutrition school setting with a graduate program, there was nothing about health at every size or even intuitive eating. So for the listener that are like, I've never heard about this, don't feel bad. Even at professional, we've never heard about this during our training. Oh, that is so true. We were also talking about in a four-year dietetics program for dietitians, most programs don't talk about health at every size, intuitive eating, or even eating disorders, which is mind-blowing to me. This is something we have to learn about somehow and educate ourselves on, and hopefully that can change. The more we talk about it and spread awareness, I think it'll start being something we all learn. Yes. And so, and it comes from that place of self-education and choosing your own path, which is what I've been teaching all along. Like, this is why I'm putting this episode in front of you today. So you can learn about what Molly refers as haze. And I'll say it in the long term health at every size. And I'll let Molly describe what it is. So if you've never heard about it, so there we go. So what is health at every size? Let's begin there. Sure. It's a weight-inclusive approach to improving physical, emotional, and spiritual health. The focus is on sustainable, health-promoting behaviors rather than focusing on intentional weight loss. So we really just set aside weight at all. So we're not going to weigh you. We're not going to focus on the weight changes at all. The focus is really on wellness and making better lifestyle choices and all those things in the long term end up or can lower triglycerides, improve cholesterol, reduce rates of disordered eating. It can boost self-esteem and body image. This is because here's the thing. When we think of weight loss, a lot of people say, oh, I want to lose weight to be healthy. When I mean, we'll dig into that later, but we're really focusing on thinness when we're focusing on losing weight. We're not necessarily focusing on health promoting behavior. So we have to kind of tease apart those two concepts, what's healthy and what's just, you know, I'm just trying to live in a smaller body. And that is a big thing for the women that are listening right now. And I want to take this moment for you to the listener to really close your eyes right now and ask yourself, why am I chasing weight loss and or why was I chasing weight loss? Because the politically correct reason is I want to be healthy. That's what we say out loud. And that's what I think we even think a little bit. But when we dig and we're really honest with ourselves, it's exactly what Molly just says. If we're chasing thinness because we're hoping for a better life on the other side. Yeah. And we've been taught this our whole lives. I mean, our, our parents taught us this. The media taught us this. I mean, it's just everywhere. It's hard to escape it. Yes, and it's what 
we're being told when we go to the doctor, right? We're being reinforced by what we believe to be an authority that that's what we need to chase. So health at every size helps you with a concept, which we'll talk about here in, in science and studies to break down this equation that we have in our head, I guess, right? Health equals weight or proper BMI. Am I correct? Yes, absolutely. So let's get over the big roadblocks of how can this be, Molly, that a healthy body does not equal a teen body? That's a big one, right? Yeah, I was like, okay, wait, where do I start? Where, where do we start? <laughs> I mean, I think the hardest thing and the, the number one thing is that weight is not a good indicator of health, even though this is something we've been taught our whole life. And that weight loss can have some short-term improvement in health risk factors. And it also increases food and body preoccupation, self-hatred, eating disorders or disordered eating, weight cycling. And ultimately what it comes down to is the majority of diets fail. So if we're trying to improve our health by dieting, you know, in two to five years, most of us are going to regain the weight and up to two thirds of us are going to gain more than what we lost. So going on a diet is actually the greatest predictor of weight gain. So that's what got me. I felt like I ran into a wall when I first learned that because it was also really true for me. Every time I dieted, I just gained more weight back. I kept getting, you know, bigger and bigger, which mm -hmm. that's a whole other thing too. That's all like weight stigma and fat phobia that we all have to address personally. So I'm not saying that a bigger body is a bad thing. It's just that if I wanted to get a smaller body, then dieting is not a very effective tool to achieve that. And I think we can all agree with you. I, that's my story. And that's 99% of the listener's story. But yet, we keep re-engaging in it. Yes. We're living proof it doesn't work, but we keep wanting to do it. Why is that? Is that the whole fat phobia thing? Yeah, absolutely. We're told that thinness is happiness and success and it's valued. And so that comes from our culture teaching us this stuff. So of course, we're going to keep chasing that. The Weight Watchers financial chairman described it as it's like the lottery. If you don't win, you play again, and maybe you'll win the second time is his quote. And so he was asked, you know, how is your business so successful when only 16% maintain weight loss? And he said, because 84% of people will return. It's a, it's big business to go to Weight Watchers. It's a very lucrative business for Weight Watchers. They know it fails and that people are going to be repeat customers. They're going to keep coming back for years and decades on end. That's crazy. I, I've never heard about that. <laughs> I just read about that in the, it's this book called Secrets from the Eating Lab. Oh, that's amazing. So yeah. let's get over some of the assumptions. So I printed from the website, Health at Every Size, a Health at Every Size manifesto, which I'm going to join. It's a free document that you can get. It's going to be in the show notes. But I've got here like the six major assumption that the creator and the founder of the health at every size movement kind of hash down for the media. So I'd like to play with that with you over the next few minutes and, and then have you answer how this assumption is not true. You want to play that game? Okay. Yeah, let's try it. <laughs> okay. Assumption number one is that overweight and obese people die sooner than leaner people. Okay. So that's not true. Mm -hmm. And actually people in the overweight and obese categories can actually live longer lives than those in the normal and underweight categories. So, I mean, we have research that backs this up. So why we don't hear that? I mean, there's just so many factors to it. And I think money has a lot to do with it mm -hmm. in terms of research and what gets out into the media. And I want to add another layer, which I'm sure I'll, you'll agree with me being a therapist and me being focused on emotion and spiritual aspect of health is the fact that people don't want to see the link between a disturbed emotional body and a challenged mental body and the effect that it has on our health, mm -hmm. which has a huge impact. So if you're constantly chasing dieting and you're constantly hating your body, it has tremendous impact on your health. 
Yes, it creates so much stress, which we know is linked to a ton of physical problems. I also want to add that let's remember that although our bodies have, as a population, gotten bigger, yes, but life expectancy has also increased from age 70.8 in 1970 to 78.6 in 2017. So let's keep that in mind. Yes, we're getting bigger. And also we have added almost eight years to our life in the last 47 years, if I did the math right on that. (laughs) So let's look at this assumption, right? It is a fact that the body is getting larger. People are, from a, a numbers perspective, way more. Why is that from a health at every size perspective? So the book talks a lot about how our food has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different factors. So there's stress. We've been talking a lot about dieting and how, I mean, we have really as a culture become extremely obsessed with dieting and that's affecting our metabolisms. It's increasing our body weight because we're losing muscle mass and the psychological and physiological mechanisms that kick in that create overeating. Actually, we're trying to get rid of that word, (laughs) more of eating past fullness because restriction leads to overeating, eating past fullness. So our bodies are getting bigger the more we're dieting. So it's a combination of the food that we have, and the stressors that we have in our lives, and also the chronic dieting. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's more than just those three. Oh, sure. But these are what people listening to this podcast have been on the path of, right? So when we're looking at large, yes, it is a fact that we're larger. And it's not just one thing. It's not because we don't have enough willpower. It's not because all of a sudden the brain of this new generation has dropped willpower and we had willpower before. There's so many other factor and reason as to why that is. So, so that's a great explanation. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Here's another assumption. Anyone who is determined can lose weight and keep it off. Oh, I wish that were true, but it's just not. It's these lies that we've been fed that, oh, if if I can do it, you can do it too. Oh, and you know what? I think social media has really amped that up because we're not just idolizing these celebrities who have trainers and all this stuff. We're looking at women and men in our communities, people we actually know, and we're witnessing their weight loss journeys. We're seeing their before and after pictures and we're really not getting the whole picture here. We just see that Susie dropped X amount of pounds and if she can do it, I can do it too. She also has very motivational quotes and this is how I do this. But again, it's just not true. There's this thing called set point theory. Please talk about that. Oh, sure. This is the second point. Yes. So there is a range that our bodies prefer to function at. And it actually can range between 10 and 20 pounds. And your body is going to fight really hard to stay within that weight range. They have done incredible studies where it's not just when you lose weight that your body is going to do whatever it can to get back into that weight range, but they've even done it in the opposite direction where they have fed people many more calories than they need just to see what would happen to their bodies. And people gained anywhere between nine and 29 pounds eating the same amount. So the same amount of food led some people to gain three times more weight than others. They added a genetic component here. So they had identical twins do the same thing and they gained about the same amount, which just means that genetics play a huge part in that. So because we're all different and body diversity exists, you just cannot compare yourself to your neighbor or your friend who lost that weight. We can't all do it. And our bodies are going to fight hard to stay in that weight range. Set point is a huge component that we've not talked on the podcast yet. But could we say that this set point you talked about, the more we've dieted, the more we've lost and gained, more and lost and gained, is actually even more sensitive because of the damage we've done through dieting? Yes. And they're saying that we are 
dieting into a higher set point so we can change that. We can increase that. That's where some of that anger, at least for me, came in when I realized, wow, I dieted myself into a bigger body. Mm. And it's so frustrating. And I think a lot of us have grief over, you know, what, what would I have looked like and what would my life have been like if I had never started dieting back when I was a young child? It's interesting you say that because when we survey our student, my crowd is only women, and we ask them why they chose to do this journey with us. The number two reason is their children. Mm, that's awesome. And not wanting to do exactly what you just said, which is to pass on their, quote, food and body issues to their children. It gives me hope because that is the best thing we can do for our kids. And for many of us, our parents didn't know that and we're going to love them anyways. They did the best they could with what they knew. And now we learn and we know more. And so for us to make peace with food and our body, that is the best gift we can give to our kids. Every client I've ever had who has disordered eating has shared with me that their parents had their own issues with food and were chronic dieters. So this is one way we can stop that cycle. And I want to layer to that for people that have not been diagnosed with eating disorder. That is my same observation as a professional. When we dig into the personal story, of women that are coming wanting to change their relationship to food and body, it stemmed from like seven or eight years old seeing their mom diet. Yep. And a lot of people did the diets with their moms. Yeah. Well, I did the cabbage soup diet at 12 with my mom. Oof. So there you go, right? Yeah. But again, I wanted to link to Health at Every Size. Health at Every Size came out of that. So it's not a movement that has been around for, for years. How long has Health at Every Size as a movement been in this present in the world? Ooh, I don't know if I know the exact answer for that. The book Health at Every Size is, I think it was written in 2008. Yeah, it's very recent. Yeah, relatively recent. The concept, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't start too much, you know, earlier than that. I'm not sure though. But it came out of observing the outcome of dieting, right? The the whole craze in the 70s and the 80s of dieting and like seeing this happen. I'm sure there was a place of wanting to understand why this happened and, and health at every size came out of that. Yeah. Linda Bacon, who wrote that book, and actually the concept happened before the book was written. She did a lot of her own research, did all kinds of master's and PhD programs in different disciplines to try to understand that, try to understand why don't diets work. And yeah, I think it does come from, okay, what we're doing here isn't working and why is that? And what can we do differently? What's going to actually be more effective? Yeah. So if you've not heard about health at every size, which most of you probably did, and it's because it's quote fairly new, like it's just mm -hmm. recent and it's a result of what we're talking about here, those assumptions that health equal weight. And that's why I want to give you this for 2019, this other point of view of what can be health. And instead of chasing weight, you're chasing health. Here's another assumption. Weight loss will prolong my life. Okay, so that's not true either. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a single study that proves losing weight will prolong your life. We, there's just no evidence there. So we can't, again, where did we learn this? One person told another, I, mean, I don't know where they're actually getting this from, but it has come to be known as this truth, this universal truth, but it's not true. It's not going to, to increase our life. Yeah. And, and for my science ladies here, the document that will be in the show note will have all the studies sustaining what Molly's answering here. So if you want a proof, all the studies will be listed there for you to look at. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, because like we can say that, but it's so shocking to some people that they're like, show me the proof, right? Show me the money. And I want to talk a little bit. I want to take a little bit of a tangent on this assumption here about this whole political aspect, because I think in my point of view, based on my background in the medical world, this assumption that weight loss will prolong life is actually to the benefit of the medical care business and the pharmaceutical business, because with that, they can sell you product. 
Oh yeah. It's big business. It's a huge business, right? Mm -hmm. And weight loss surgeries, that is one of the most expensive surgeries to have. So of course they're recommending that left and right, but that also doesn't result in better health either. No. And we've all had that person in our life. I always often give this example, that 10 running healthy quote person in our life who quote dies of a heart attack at 45 years old and they would tend their whole life. What's up with that? Oh yeah. Bob Harper, you yeah. know, the, the trainer from the biggest loser, he had a heart attack. All, and the other thing is every disease or health condition that's associated with people in larger bodies, heart disease, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, those are all present in people with smaller bodies. Mm -hmm. So try not to think of that as that is just a bigger body problem. So let's go with our last assumption, which roll right into this. Health is declining as a result of an obesity epidemic. Health is declining. I mean, when I look at health, health is declining as a result of chronic dieting and this pursuit of thinness and that it's creating a lot more stress on the body than living in a larger body. And again, I think it's, it is going to be a lot more helpful to have the specific research on this. So I'm going to point you all to look at the health at every size book. There's so much research in there that's going to blow your mind on the specifics of each study that's been done on this. Well, we can just talk about the life expectancy that you mentioned earlier, right? Which over the last number of years, the expectancy has increased. So if health is really declining, why would our life expectancy increase? Exactly. And I can't tell you how often I have clients tell me, oh, I just want to lose weight. I want to be healthy. And I ask them, well, what health issues do you have? And the majority of them say they don't have any health problems presently. So it's like, why don't we see that? I'm not exactly sure. So from a therapist, from a psychological expert or a mental health expert, why do we think like that? Like, what is the reason why we chase something that really we've no problem with? Is it an excuse? Like, or is it a paradigm? Like what's going on in our head? It's just something that we have learned since birth. You know, that's what's represented in the media, that that's what's healthy. This is what our doctors have been trained to believe that this is what's healthy. You got to stay in this weight range. Okay. We could talk about BMI yeah. for a bit. So BMI was never meant, it was never intended to be used in medical settings. It was never meant to judge someone's health. This was something that was formulated by a mathematician to use in research studies, just talking about weight diversity. However, insurance companies decided to use this as a reason to charge more for insurance. And they're using this correlation of weight and health issues but there's still no proven causation. So just because people in higher weights have some health issues, it doesn't mean that being in a larger body causes it. I always use the example of there are increased sales of ice cream in the summertime, and there's also increased murder rates. Sure, there is some correlation there. Yeah, but you can't say that murderers eat more ice, ice cream, cream in the summertime. I mean, you can't like, there's no causation. One doesn't cause the other. There may be correlation, but doesn't, there's no causation. Genetics play a huge role in this. That's something I probably should have mentioned earlier. <laughs> Genetics are huge when it comes to health issues. And then there's social determinants of health that, I mean, that's much bigger. That's something like, you know, socioeconomic status that's access to healthcare, those things are going to really affect how healthy a body can be. Mm -hmm. And even me with a background in functional medicine, this is something that we constantly have to get people to focus on, is that their example, their high blood pressure, is not due to their weight, it's due likely to the inflammation in the body. And let's figure out why you're inflamed. And you know what, 50% of your inflammation in your body is coming from your thoughts. So let's get the mm. stress under control, right? Mm -hmm. At 
even if we reduce your weight, you are still probably going to have a high blood pressure if you're stressed every minute of the day. Yeah, that's a great point. And I've also had some friends and close people to me recently be diagnosed pre-diabetic and they're all in smaller bodies and they're very physically active. Genetics play a huge role in this. Just as a side note, that's something I suggest for my clients in larger bodies when doctors, you know, let's say they diagnose them with the same thing that, Hey, you're, you're pre-diabetic mm-hmm. and they recommend them to lose weight. I know it's hard to do, but I, I recommend my clients to say, okay, great. What would you recommend to somebody with the same condition in a smaller body? Cause that's going to be more effective than just lose weight. That's not the recommendation that my close friends are getting who are in smaller bodies for the same condition. That is awesome. Okay. So let's explore that. So we've got, I think the whole concept of health and weight knockdown, right? No link between the two. So Mm -hmm. I'm a listener. I'm convinced of that. I may have gone down to the research and like prove to myself this is true, but I'm back here and I'm like, okay, I'm get it. How do I deal with my doctor? So can you repeat that conversation that you're coaching your clients with on how to have that discussion? Oh, it is so hard. Yes. Let's repeat that. Yes. Actually. So number one, I actually recommend them refusing to weigh in. You know how the doctor is, you come in, you have to weigh yourself or so we believe we don't have to weigh ourselves. So sometimes we do. Yeah. So if we're going to go under anesthesia or something, it's going to be important for them to know your weight. But if you're just doing an annual check-in or checkup, you can refuse to weigh yourself. And I know it's scary because I've done it myself and I I was very kind of sheepish and like, oh, <laughs> can I refuse? <laughs> and you know, she kind of laughed and said, of course. Sometimes they just need to get another biometric measure. So, you know, they're checking your pulse and your blood pressure and maybe they'll, they'll just find a third thing. And that's just for insurance. That's just so insurance will cover the session. So number one, you can refuse to weigh in so they're not picking on you about your weight. That doesn't totally guarantee you that they're not going to say something about your weight. Now, when and if a doctor recommends you lose weight for whatever issue you're going to the doctor to see. So I had a client go in because she was worried she was having a heart attack, actually. And it turned out she was having a panic attack. I was going to say, yes, that's always that. Yes. And, you know, of course, the doctor recommends weight loss surgery. And it's like, well, no, let's figure out how to treat panic attacks, but that's something else. So what I would encourage that client to say to the doctor is what would you recommend to somebody in a smaller size with the same problem? If somebody else came in in a smaller size and they had a panic attack, what do you recommend? Cause losing weight's not going to do that. That's a brilliant one liner that doesn't have to get complicated. No, but it is kind of scary to do, right? <laughs> Yeah, so I'll, I'll add my coaching to that. So one of the point because I'm I'm huge on empowerment. My first place is really ask yourself like who's working for who here. Like you're the customer, uh-huh. you're paying through your insurance or through your own pocket, whatever model you're under. He or she is working for you. That's such a good point. So let's. Let's put the power in its place right now. And second, if they don't want to do or help you where you are, like fire them, move on. There's other doctors you can go and see. The power is in your court. Yeah. Find a new doctor. Get a second opinion. too. Yes. I mean, if that's what they're stuck on, that you just need to lose weight, then find another doctor. See what they think. Yeah. So take back your power, I guess, is my message. And this one line, what would you do with someone with a smaller body? I think those two things can equip you if you feel disempowered in face of your medical authority. Now, some people are going to be afraid of what the doctor is going to say. Like, what, well, what is health at every size? What are you yeah. talking about? Mm-hmm. And there are already written out letters, basically, that you can give to your doctor online. If, if it's kind of overwhelming to explain, which it is, it's a lot. And it's scary to basically go up against your doctor. So there are printouts, I believe, on the Health at Every Size website. But if you just Google it, there's actually a couple of different options. of Different people have written things that you can just hand them the sheet of paper. Yeah, the document that I have in front of me right now could be that as well, right? It's all filled with doctor love, scientific evidence, right? And all the studies listed one after the other. 
of sustaining your point. So take back your power and then have that discussion with the doctor. But when you get back home, what can we do? So now we know that health does not equal our weight. We are equipped to have that conversation and get proper care from our medical team. Mm -hmm. But how do we live health at every size on a day-to-day basis? Like what are the principles? Oh, that's a great question. So we're focusing on health promoting behaviors and where I think a lot of us can agree, including the people who are still not on board with Hayes is these behaviors are actually very similar to the ones we engage in when we're dieting, but it's for a very different reason. So intention matters here. So what can we actually do is work on intuitive eating, which is that's a whole other podcast, right? Yes. <laughs> Talking about the 10 principles of intuitive eating, making peace with food in your body. And then other health promoting behaviors are going to be like, you know, trying to get at least seven hours of sleep at night, increasing your joyful movement, quitting smoking and vaping, quitting drugs, limiting alcohol, getting adequate water intake, coping skills to manage stress, face to face quality time with support system mindfulness, meditation, therapy, diaphragmatic breathing. I mean, there's all kinds of health promoting behaviors that are way more sustainable because it's not pass or fail like a diet is. It's very different to try to increase your water intake than it is to follow a diet plan. That's something you can do your whole life. Mm -hmm. But it's more, you have to engage more than just the food in that. You have to engage your thoughts. You have to engage your emotion and heal from many other aspects than just controlling your food. Yes, absolutely. There's so, it's very multifaceted. One of the biggest hurdles that women have to get through, I think, is accepting our size or accepting our body, body acceptance, yes. whatever that thing is. <laughs> whatever you want to name it is irrelevant. It's the action of accepting who you are in the body that you are right now. Mm-hmm. Could we say that that is the first step of yeah. living and breeding health at every size? It is. And I'm not going to say you have to accomplish this first before you move on to the second, third, or fourth principle, but it's a huge one. So learning to love and appreciate the body you've been gifted and some steps for that might include unfollowing toxic or disordered accounts. It's really hard to learn to accept yourself if you're only following other people who are on diets or who are in smaller bodies than you. So if you can diversify your social media, that's going to be a huge step in your recovery. Getting rid of your scale. Stop weighing yourself. It's going to be much easier to accept your size when you aren't focusing on numbers anymore. Delete that food tracking app in your phone. Limit social media use. Another part I like to focus on is body neutrality to try to help accept your body, that your body is neither good nor bad. It's just neutral. We need to get away from the negative thoughts about it. So it's hard to move from thinking negatively about your body to positively, but you, we can all be neutral about it, right? It's just a body. And that's what we teach here is body neutrality, right? It's the whole unlabeling of things. Yeah. Yeah unlabeling of the body, unlabeling of food. Food is neither good or bad. It just has consequence, right? Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to go and put yourself on a bikini and go in the beach and show your body to everyone and like be the body positivity activist neither. Like, can we just be neutral? Yeah. You know, some people feel like that's self-objectification too, or it's objectifying your body. And you don't have to do that. But if that's empowering to you, go for it. Yes. But for most women listening, that is like complete, like having a heart attack, having to do this. And that's not what accepting your body is. Mm -mm. So I really love that place of body neutrality is just in the middle here. So working on accepting our body is one of the key step in living a health at every size life. And you talked a little bit about intuitive eating. And for me, intuitive eating is this whole other component of health at every size, which is trusting ourselves. Yes, learning to trust it. Mm -hmm. And diet took that away from us. Oh, yeah. Diets told us that we weren't to be trusted, that we have to follow somebody else's rules of what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat, what's good and bad. 
So intuitive eating helps us reconnect with ourselves and listen to our body's inner cues. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, when you need to go to the bathroom, right? And you trust that. So you go to the bathroom. We can learn to trust our hunger and fullness cues in the same way that we trust that our body is going to just take as much oxygen as it needs. And it's your heart's going to keep beating. We don't really think about those things. It just happens. So when those hunger cues start to kick in, we can trust that. We can trust that we'll know what, I mean, it's not this easy. It's not like you're going to be able to be this intuitive eater tomorrow, but over time you can trust that you'll know what's satisfying to your body and what feels good in your body. And that's a huge step. It's also part of living this health at every size is rekindling that trust part of our life. Mm -hmm. And just keep in mind that we're all born intuitive eaters. So all of your clients who have kids or they have a child in their life, they're close to you, watch them eat. They're the best teachers of this. They're very good at it. They haven't gotten into diet culture yet. Which, by the way, side note that just popped into my head, and I'll link into the show note, but we just published a guide to intuitive eating for children that was published by a doctor, friend of mine in Canada, a naturopathic doctor. So I'm going to link to that in the show note because that could help all the moms out there as well on how to bring intuitive eating to our whole household, not just us, but everyone. Oh, that's incredible. So trust is a huge piece. And then adopting healthy lifestyle habits is the other piece without focusing on weight loss. Oh, yeah. So I guess I skipped ahead. Yeah, that's okay. (laughs) So all those behaviors I was talking about before. So a healthy lifestyle habit, just increasing your joyful movement. Don't do anything that you hate doing. You'll never catch me in a kickboxing class or spinning class. Oh, but if you like it, go for it. If that's fun to you and you like the music and you know, you have a sense of community there, go for it. But especially in my, the early days of this journey for me, I just needed to chill out and go for some walks. And I'm not talking Oprah style, very quick walking. It's <laughs> just getting out and moving my body. It felt good. To get the endorphin kick after, right? To feel yes. better. Yes. And I think we're a lot like plants you know, or kind of like solar panels, we need to get out in the sun and we need to mm-hmm. reconnect in nature. And then I would plug into some podcasts on these, you know, your podcast would be a great podcast to start with. So listening to this stuff and walking, I mean, it feels good. It's a lot easier to stay with that kind of a plan than, I don't know, I can't even think of P90X or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what I call no pain, no gain movement. Oh yeah, that's not fun at all. So let's talk a little bit about food choices. And so what I have observed in my practice is that there is a shifting of taste. So people will come in having been on the highly processed type of food, and then their taste bud is not there and has the integrate more nutritious choices of food than their natural choices change. But intuitive eating, does it mean to eat crap, processed McDonald's kind of food all the time. And I know I could be labeling here, which is not good, but that kind of food, does that mean always eating that? Because that's a fear that many people have. I think the fear is most people's experiences when they've been dieting their whole life is they believe intuitive eating is going to be the kind of eating that they do in between diets. And that's not true, but it might be that way for a short period of time it's going to work itself out. So what we call that is habituation. So with repeated exposure to certain foods, it starts to lose its allure. Like it's not up on a pedestal anymore. So yeah, you might want to eat ice cream every day for a few days or a few weeks, maybe a few months. I don't know. Everybody's different. And you might eat McDonald's all the time. And there's nothing wrong with McDonald's. But it's going to lose its allure. You're going to notice that you're not craving that anymore. You're going to crave more variety in your food. One of the principles is about tuning into your body to notice how it feels in your body. So you're going to notice, oh, I feel kind of sluggish when I eat whatever food I just ate. And I feel a little bit more energized when I eat this other food and that there's nothing wrong with either, but you know, maybe I won't eat 
a heavy meal before I have a bunch of clients, but maybe afterwards I'll eat it. So you really get in tune with what feels good in your body. And you know, that honeymoon phase, it's scary. I know it's scary, Mm -hmm. but it's going to work itself out and you're going to eventually crave variety. And the last principle is gentle nutrition. And we can't jump into that or else it's going to be another diet. So what is gentle nutrition? I think of it as let's start experimenting with a variety of foods and how does that feel in my body and what is my body trying to tell me if I'm feeling lethargic and I'm constipated or what have you, maybe I need some fiber. And so Mm -hmm. I kind of think of it in that way, or I need to increase my greens. And, and so it's not just eat whatever you want to eat, but over time, you'll be ready to be in a place where, okay, I think I'm ready to start eating broccoli and salads. And it's not out of self-hate. It's not out of punishment. It's not out of trying to change my body. It's because it feels good. And that works into the second book of this author, Linda Bacon, is Body Respect. Mm-hmm. My yeah. gentle nutrition, it's kind of brothers and sisters to body respect because if you notice that X food makes you feel sluggish or gives you cramps, if you are in a loving relationship with this body of yours, how can you respect it yet cause it pain? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And that's why people think, oh, intuitive eating isn't for everybody, but it really is for everybody. Even if you have a food allergy or, you know, whatever health condition, yeah, if you're allergic to peanut butter, you're not going to feel good. So, I mean, it's, you're, you are paying attention to what works in your body. And so it does work for many health conditions. It's not for certain specific people. It's, it can be used for everybody. And I think it comes back to what you said earlier. It's all about intention. So if you have celiac disease mm-hmm. and your intention is to live an energized life and a longer life, then eating gluten is likely not going to get you to that place of health and longevity because your intestine are going to die, right? Because you have celiac conditions. So yes, it's intuitive eating to not eat gluten. Am I correct? Yeah, absolutely. It's not going to feel good if you eat no. it. <laughs> right? So yes, intuitive eating and body respect is for everyone. Yeah. Did I miss anything about health at every size that we need to mention in this 101 episode here? Oh, the fourth one of embracing size and diversity, I think is huge. Okay, go for it. What does that mean? So I think it's just important that we embrace size diversity, that we all come in different sizes, just as some of us are tall and some of us are short. Some of us are going to be thinner bodied and some are bigger body. We have to embrace that size diversity and I think what goes along with the fear of intuitive eating is what if I gain weight and really nobody knows, even dietitians aren't going to know what size you're going to end up. If you start intuitive eating, you might lose weight and you might stay the same and you might gain weight. We don't know. And I think that's when we have to confront our own internalized fat phobia and what we think that means if our body changes. And so, I mean, that, that can be a tough journey as well, but it's important that we just, we learn to embrace size diversity. And like I said, try to diversify your own social media and your real life friends. Let's make sure that we are interacting and embracing and accepting everybody for whatever size they are. Yeah. I think it's, I know for me in my own journey of body acceptance, one of the bigger influencer was when I started to diversify my Facebook and my Instagram of the image that I was seeing and seeing larger body. And that really with time, probably a couple months really started to change the way I look at the world. So I would highly encourage that if you are on social media. Yeah, I felt the same way. Yeah. And it's still to this day, like it's a blend of all kinds of size and body. And and then we can bring the discussion to like politics of, or the goals of this year is gender diversity and, and all this, like it goes along all that path of thinking as well. Yeah. I mean, all of this stuff really is interconnected, kind of like you were yes. saying with, I think it was with acceptance or maybe it's neutralizing. So when you neutralize foods, kind of goes along with neutralizing your body, might neutralize other people's bodies. It's really all interconnected. Well, I'm a big, I'm a mindfulness teacher alongside Mm -hmm. to what I do. So for me, in the mindfulness path that I studied Zen Buddhism, like everything is neutral. 
So for me, that's my approach to everything, right? Neutral food, neutral body, neutral emotion. And when you start living like that, everything becomes less offensive. Like when your nervous system is high, you react to everything, right? Yes. When you're calm and more neutral, what used to offend you, you're like, huh, whatever. Like, I'm not going to get into this. <laughs> Move on. Oh, that's great. I was just thinking about how that affects how you view yourself and other people. Yes. And if we can really believe that we're really just all doing our best, it really will neutralize whatever the situation may be. And that's why for me, when you work on ditching the whole diet with the whole tennis and all of that, and you start incorporating health at every size, Yes, it will short term get you to a place of neutrality with food and body. But let me tell you, it's going to affect all the other part of your life. Yeah. How you engage with your kids, your husband, your work, like everything. You will then see the possibility of being neutral in all the other aspects of your life. And that's why people have life transformation beyond just food relationship transformation. What really strikes me especially so the further you get away from dieting and diet mentality, you will begin to see how much time, money, energy, brain space, conversations, they were all focused on food and losing weight and your body and other people's bodies. It takes up so much, which again is where the grief comes in. It's like, wow, I really, I don't know if everybody's going to feel like they wasted all that time, money, energy, brain space, but yeah. So anyways, the more you walk away from diet mentality, you're going to find so much extra time, money, energy, brain says you, you might want to do something completely different with your life. It's really transformational. It really does affect your whole life. Yeah. And I think we're going to end it to this because that is the big outcome at the end. Is there anything else we would like to mention, Molly? Well, I don't know. I feel like that was a pretty good point there. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the perfect point to end. <laughs> <And> that, <laughs> with that. So I'll put Molly's Instagram account on the show notes. I would highly recommend that you follow her because that is diversity that you will see to her account. She's awesome as sharing very provocative thoughts that really gets you to see another point of view. And that's how I engage with her. That, that was my own. I was at a stage in my career where I wanted to explore health at every size within the context of eating disorder. And that's how I came across her. So I started to follow her to get taught provocative point of view on food and body from this particular aspect. So I'd highly recommend you follow her. So keep doing the work you're doing. Oh, thank you so much. And I agree with that. If you can find as many people who are sharing this stuff on social media, you know, listening to the podcast, I really highly recommend, especially for those of you who need to see the evidence and the numbers and the research, reading the book Health at Every Size is going to be key here. It's so incredible. It's very informational. It's like a Bible. It is. And it's thick. Yes. <laughs> there's a lot in there. And there's also the intuitive eating book. They really go hand in hand with each other. So those are kind of like the, that's where I would start my research. Absolutely. And thank you very much for having been with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Wow. So what do you think? I know it's a podcast, you can't talk to me, but I would love to get your feedback on email on social media, but I'm sure you agree with me that it makes sense. And what can we do now? First of all, if you're part of the people that are saying, yep, yeah, that makes sense. I know it. She just convinced me to step over on the other side of health at every size. And that's what we do, right? So the going to be on the food method with our program is there to take your hand and guide through true going beyond the food and health at every size. So we have the Academy, which is a 14 week group coaching program where you get to interact with me and Right now, if you're listening to this live, we are in registration time. We have an info session that you can register for on January the 15th at stephaniedoze.com slash open house, or you can go to the show notes and 
register for the info session, or you can book a discovery call, one-on-one call with one of us, and then we'll make sure that it's right for you. We also have, if you are outside of the registration time, we also have Claim Your Food Freedom program, which is our entry level program that you can register for. The link for that will be in the show note. But I want to address all the other ones that are saying, yeah, makes sense, but not sure. So what do we do if that's you? Number one, I want you to go over to our self-assessment to evaluate your relationship to food and see if dieting has had the collateral damage on how you relate to food in your body. You're going to go to stephaniedoze.com slash quiz and take the 10 question assessment. This is not a professional assessment. It's something that I made so it can be accessible to everyone, but it's going to give you a good understanding of where you are and are you in a place where you have had the side effect of dieting. Two, you're going to go to the show note stephaniedoze.com slash 171, download the free PDF manifesto of health at every size and read it. If you're one of those sciencey people who need the proof, then click the link to the, I think, well over 30 different scientific studies that are sitting behind this method or this movement. And then go read the book, Health at Every Size. It's available on Amazon and everywhere. And then come back and tell me, so now are you ready? And do you need some help? And then we'll help you and take you through the process of going beyond the food and adopt a health at every size mindset when it comes to your health, your body. I'm grateful that you are here with me and that you allowed me to lead you through this groundbreaking way of living. In the next episode, we will talk about the collateral damage of dieting, the number one collateral damage, which is food perfectionism and obsession about food and how to overcome that. So stay tuned with that show 172 and it's a bonus episode. So be sure to be subscribed to the podcast to get it. I love you girls and I look forward to hang out with you in the next episode. Do you wish your relationship to food and perhaps your body was easier? Do you wish you could make peace with food and your body? Most women will describe the state of being as having food freedom. And likely you've tried potentially everything to get there. And you are certain that something is seriously wrong with you. Maybe you're thinking that more restriction has to be the solution. I get it. And trust me. I've been there too, for almost 27 years. You see, what most struggling women never ever realize is that how you engage with food in your body has little to do with food itself. Sadly, most women rely on outdated strategy like restriction and willpower and discipline as their solution. Things like the black and white mindset, the diet pills, the cheat day to control their urges. But you and I know that has nothing to do with food freedom. So that's why I want to share with you the assessment that I use in my clinic with my one-on-one client to identify what is holding them back from food freedom. And quite frankly, it's different from anything you've done before. I've created the food freedom score, this assessment tool to give you an idea of where you should be focusing on. During this quiz, I'm going to take you through 10 simple yes or no questions that will allow you to assess the sticky point with your relationship with food and your body. Plus, I'll coach you at the end on specific steps you need to take to move forward to get your food freedom. So if you're ready to step into a new version of yourself and create a new relationship with food in your body, head over to stephaniedoze.com slash quiz, and I'll see you on the other side.